<clears throat> okay. Yes, I'm sorry. You had a question. I, I really. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. When this session restarts, she'll be yeah. there. We normally bring. We ask her. Bring her into the room. Okay. By, uh, online. Okay. How do I do that? I don't know. Jeremy. Okay. Just a. Yeah, yeah, thanks for letting me know. Yeah. The online people, I need to be like, in the room or something, or are they participating or feeling like they're Yeah. No, you just need to do anything. Okay. Um, I forgot to mention, by the way, this uh, link here is I have a, a blog that um, engages with writers, and there's several articles in there. About getting a career as a screenwriter and mistakes to avoid, uh, et cetera, and so forth. They cover some of the things I'm talking about today, but uh, they're just very accessible and very short articles, and they're very sort of pragmatic and to the point. And again, you know, uh, mistakes to avoid, how to get a career, you know, all that kind of good. So, how to find an agent and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, okay. Um, before we get into this one, let me just quickly finish off on the. So, that's, I kind of zoomed through the. Um, the pitching sort of instructions, guidance, whatever you want to call it, at the end of the, the, the last lecture. Do we have any questions? Was there anything unclear about, you know, what, what I'm looking for in a pitch? One of the things, by the way, that, that does work if you're doing an elevator pitch is by illustrating where you're going. I mean, some people don't like this, but it definitely, if you're in the receiving end as a producer of a pitch, it helps, right? So by, by, by throwing in a, a comparison to a couple of films that kind of generally go in the direction. Obviously, they, they need to be very successful films um, that to illustrate where, where you're going with your script. So that's bear in mind. Executives listen to masses of pitches on a daily basis that can help you stand out more. So um, I definitely um, I, I like that. Um, quickly, just to tail end on the um, the pitching business, there's a um, so many years ago, Fox Studios were having, was having a hard time. Um, a, a chap called Barry Dillon came into the, the studio, and he's the guy who got the television site going, you know, very effectively. And he gave the studio a huge boost. He's a huge player in Hollywood. You know, Barry Dillon, David Geffen. There's a certain generation of, you know, movie moguls who are very dominant, very um, Spielberg, you know, all that lot. A friend of mine was an agent. Was um, tried for seven years to sell Barry screenplays. And this guy would just turn everything down, turn everything down, this guy selling some of the screenplays to others. And and every time Barry said, no, pass, he'd just say, okay, fine, we'll find you something else, Barry, we'll find you something else. And after about five years, when Barry moved on to do something else, this guy finally got the, the courage to confront Barry Diller uh, and ask, look, why are you constantly turning down all these, all these, all these screenplays? And he said, um, basically, you as the agent will have spent a considerable amount of time on the screenplay that you're sending to me for, for cons consideration. You will live with it with your writer probably I know, for a year, if not a year, at least several months. You will know it really well. You give it to me, I will engage with this thing. Usually it gets sent to a reader, and this is something I will cover later on as well. And I will spend maybe 15 minutes on your screenplay. So my understanding of it is like minimal comparison to in comparison to yours. And if I just get get up to you and say no, pass, and you just kind of turn around and say, okay, you know, um, fine, let's find you something else. It does not communicate to me a huge amount of faith in the project. All right. So basically, what I'm trying to say to you is, and basically, what he was trying to say to this agent was, um, the fact that something somebody turns something down doesn't mean it, it's over. At times, people just can't be bothered, or at times they will just test the waters and say, well. If I turn their script down and they spend two years on this thing and they just go toddle off. Um, if you don't stand up for yourself, say, hold on a second, Barry, um, this will make a great movie because of this, that and the other. I am sure that this actor who's just made you a zillion dollars in this film will want to play that role because it's taking him or her in a different direction, so on and so forth. So you start putting the thing together for them. They actually really kind of appreciate that. OK, that shows that you have backbone, that you have conviction, that you have, obviously, as a right and a concern amount of enthusiasm for the project and faith and belief in it. So what I'm saying to you is just because somebody turns it down doesn't mean that's the end of the, the end of the show. At times or quite often, you can get back in their faces and say, hold on a second. 
uh, I want, I need you to reconsider X, Y, and Z, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. And really, you know, make your case. You know, this is a year or more of your life in there. Don't just be some, you know, so-and-so turns it down. Doesn't mean that's that, that's the end of the show. So I've seen a lot of writers, not a lot, but quite a few writers um, get, a, get a second bite of the apple just because they were tenacious and didn't do what this agent guy did uh, and just kind of, you know, toddle off. So just bear that in mind. Um, Again, rules are there to be broken, but as I said, you need to know the rules. So when I say to you, elevate the pitch and then maybe a, a five minute follow up and at times when you go to a studio meeting, and as mentioned, I've done about 3,000 last and things, um, they will tell you, you've got 20 minutes, you've got 25 minutes, so on and so forth. So, so you can, you know, kind of uh, uh, adjust um, accordingly. Um, but you know, I went to pitch with one guy uh, who was the, again, I can't mention names, but the, the brother of a very, very, very famous actress. And he had this very deep voice and uh, there's something dodgy about him because he had, uh, again, I can't tell you, but I, <laughs> he had suspicions that he had spent time in the mall. Anyway, hugely interesting character. This guy actually went, went to pitch to the head of a new line back there. And uh, she was in there with uh, a woman called Mary Parent, who was a very, junior person and who I did not get the time of day to who ended up running I think Universal Pictures. So my bad. Um, but this guy pitched the entire script. Every time we went to pitch, we were in there for at least 90 minutes. He would act this thing out. And he was so good, so good with that deep voice. And I mean he would just and he had, you know, he had every scene fleshed out. So he said, you know, this role is played by Robert Downey Jr. This play, one is played by this and the other. And he was so entertaining in doing that. He had, he had a skill. He was, he's also a trained actor. No, and all the people who went to pitch to were, were the head of Warners, the head of New Line, the head of, I mean, all these major, major people. Not one person ever shut him down. Not one person ever shut him down. So again, what I'm saying to you is, takeaway for today is, is learn the rules, break them, there's 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 no machiasm, okay? Just find your way of, or, you know, stand up to people, turn down your scripts. If if you find somebody's really interested in the pitch you're doing, you know, don't shortchange yourself. Just keep going. But as I said, play to your strengths. If you don't, if you're not good at doing a 90 minute pitch, don't go there, okay? But again, just to illustrate the point I'm making, um, I had another character um, who's who had written a very nice coming of age script and i got it to the um head of uh, universal pictures and he said look we're not going to make this but i really like the writing i'll take a meeting with the writer now for the head of a studio to take a meeting with an unproduced writer is, is like unheard of it, it just doesn't happen so I, I pulled some strings and um um we went and you know i got the meeting and we had like three weeks three weeks almost four weeks for him to prepare for this thing so um very talented writer uh, went to one major film schools and so on and so forth. And um, the meeting was for 3.40 p.m. at Universal Studios. They have this big black tower in, 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 in Los Angeles in, in the valley. Uh, very uh, intimidating thing because it's, you know. Anyway, I show up at 3.30. They come and get me at 3.40. I go in there. Where the hell is my writer? 3.40, I'm in there, I'm kind of doing the, you know, the Asian song and dance, you know, like warming up the room, 3.45, 3.50, where the hell is my writer? This guy's not showing up. Um, but 3.55, he comes in covered in sweat, a uh, complete basket case. I'm uh, trying to calm him down because most, most, most times agents do not go in with the writers to pitch. I made a habit of doing that because in order to protect them more, and to so they wouldn't have to do the warm up business and you know love you mean it and all that kind of stuff so they'd be just be able to fully focus on their on their pitch so 355 this guy comes down sits down and this is the head of the studio with five or six executives in an office the size of this room top floor with views all over los angeles I and mean, this is seriously prime real estate right and this guy's got no time to waste okay and my guy starts pitching five minutes 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And he's just going, he's just 
telling a story, but there's 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 no beginning, middle, end. There's no as as you've established by now, you know, not the king of structure, but there's there's nothing. There's no acts. This guy just and I look around, he's like seriously sweating up. He's like, he's like and, so, and I'm not kidding you. He eventually turned I, I was looking at him like this is a complete meltdown, isn't it? And I didn't say that, but I was thinking it. And, and he looked at me, he says, in front of the head of the studio, he says to me, Alex, can you finish my pitch for me? This bleep, 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 had not prepared. He was making, he's in front of the head of the, the studio, he's making it up as he goes along. He had three weeks, he didn't prepare. And he was late. I mean, because God knows what. Um, and the head of the studio, absolutely ring me in front of everybody, which he was totally entitled to do. You know, he basically said, look, this is Universal Studios. We get some of the best screenwriters in the world, professionally presented. We have no time to waste. I, I took a dropping and I was absolutely, I was deserving it. I take, I take full responsibility. The guy never got no shot in town. Um, it took me six agents lived and died by the quality of their connections, all right? So my losing that guy was like colossal because that means a whole bunch of my other clients would never be able to access the university anymore. It took me about six to eight months to um, get him back on the phone again. Uh, and I was lucky that, that, he did, that he did that. And actually now we're, we're very good friends. He's just written a, a forward for my, for my book uh, this, this autumn. But again, I'm saying to you is, Whenever I, I come talk to, to, to writers and I start talking about, you know, these kind of horror stories, you know the what? They're, they're actually not infrequent. They happen, they happen a lot when writers become their own worst enemies, right? So um, this is part of it. You know, you're, you're entrepreneurs. You are, you know, you, you, it's not just about really doing good writing. It's about how you, how you engage with the industry, how you interact with it. So anyway, um, that was the, the tail end of all my pitching um, notes. You know, we can get actually started with the second one. Um, so as I was just saying, as a writer, you're an entrepreneur, start to think like one. Uh, you're an entertainer, entertain. If you're an introvert, you might need to find an extrovert writing partner. partner. Um, types of scripts for new writers. This is, this is actually very important. Your first script has to make money, bottom line. Whatever you do, if it gets turned to a film, the thing has to make money. Otherwise, uh, if it does not, you're unlikely to get a second made. Because people track screenwriters. There's this whole industry, data industry in in Los Angeles. The, the worst one with the, the CIA of, uh, oh God, here's me getting sued again. Uh, the CIA of Hollywood data galleries is an entity called National Research Group, NRG. And they have, or they used to have three floors in the center of Los Angeles next to the LA County Museum. And they do nothing but data gathered. So if if you sell a screenplay, your option screenplay, your thing doesn't make money, it'll have who was the actor in it, how much they got paid, what was the storyline, and you skip and so on and so forth. So unfortunately, these things will, will haunt you forever. So if you go to the next place and you've got a screenplay, and so on, they will say, well, hold on, your other thing, you know, didn't do too well. So, and as, as I said, the people you're selling to, you're dealing with, and again, the same thing applies to the UK microcosm. It is no different these days. Okay, it, it, this kind of data can, can be a problem down the road. OK, so. Um, avoid anything to do with. And this might sound like stating the obvious, but you have no idea how many people actually do go and write these things. Avoid anything to do with child abuse, alcoholism, racism, suicide, sports. Avoid period pieces as much as possible. Sci fi only if you or your best friends are VFX pros. Comedies are on the whole problematic as they do not have legs. A sense of humor can be a very subjective thing, also determined by your culture. What cracks people up in Brighton might well leave audiences in Yokohama completely cold. Good thrillers, smart horror, smart rom-coms rom are also good choices for a beginner, for a beginning writer trying to make their, you know, an impression in the industry. As a first time writer, you're un unlikely to get anything over $20 million produced, and $20 million is actually pretty high. Um, so, you know, 10, 12 million pounds. Um, producers and executives like to minimize risk. So they want to see you 
they want to see your lower budgeted films make money first. So like people like, you know, Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez and so on, they own, and Spike Lee with She's Got a Habit. These are all micro budgeted things they did for three, four hundred thousand dollars. And, you know, then they went up from that. Um, and then once your something smaller has made money, then they will co feel comfortable escalating budgets. I had two writers I was representing. Um, two of the most amazing, amazingly visual action writers with a huge amount of uh, humor in there. I think in the one script they wrote was basically Ghostbusters in space. I absolutely paint you. You read page one. You couldn't stop. It was that great of writing, but hugely expensive. I mean, you couldn't get those things done for less than about two hundred million dollars. And we had one of the biggest agencies in Los Angeles. It was ICM or CA or so on. The agents were just hump, hopping up and down. Oh, you know, this would be a slam dunk. We're going to sell the script for a lot of money. It's so amazingly visual. Blah 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 blah. And uh, you had, as I said, this. Big agency got behind it, went all over town to all the big producers and so on and so forth, uh, at least 20 submissions, and you know, and then you start getting one rejection after the next rejection, rejection, rejection. Very often they won't tell you why, right? It's it's hugely frustrating. Eventually, we managed to you know get it out of a couple of these people why they turned down the script. And they said the reason why they've turned down the script is because it's like a 200 million dollar screenplay from two guys who've never been produced before. So it had nothing to do with the quality of the story and, and the, the, its potential as a cinematic franchise and so on and so forth. It was to do with the fact that they'd never been produced before and the executives producing so on and so forth behind this didn't feel comfortable um, optioning and producing the material because, you know, because they weren't tried. So again, that's, that's what I'm saying to you is don't, coming out of the gate, don't try and write the next Star Wars. Um, it's it's going to make things a lot harder for yourselves. Um, actually, now that I mentioned um, Star Wars, I've um, I spent a lot of time. Admittedly, it's not one of my favorite movies. I, I spent a lot of time deconstructing the process of, of of George Lucas writing the screenplay. What he what he what he got up to because he he absolute his his mo was uh, this thing needs to make money. I need to make money with this film. That was his his obsession. Um, so when he wrote the script for. Um, for um, uh, Star Wars, he already had American Graffiti under his belt. And American Graffiti was a small independent movie, but it made a colossal amount of money. It was, I mean, it's one of the films to this day with the highest return on any motion picture ever produced based on the budget in terms of multiple returns. Um, but he knew that unless his next film was a major, block, major blockbuster, he would be relegated to the second tier of Hollywood. So he spent months analyzing successful texts, including Christopher Vogler's The Writer's Journey and Joseph Campbell's The, the Hero, Hero's Journey. <laughs> um, they say that he also read pretty much every blockbuster grade novel and screenplay and integrated the key narrative elements of success into his script as part of his quest for financial success. He absolutely hated the process because he was not organically, organically telling a story. He was editing together successful plot points from other stories, but the rest is history, as they say. So he basically, and the, the research I've done, I mean, I've, I've got a list of, 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 of key points that tend to reoccur in one way or another in most blo blockbuster movies. He just sat down, he basically read every blockbuster book and, and looked at screenplays that done really well and identified those elements which had contributed to their success and which were replicable in his in his thing so he had, he suddenly found himself with hundreds of these points to integrate into one story i mean talk about my key and, and, and then some so you know and but the people who were working with him on a daily basis saw that he absolutely detested the process as any uh, halfway decent screenwriter uh, would do but his you know his his commitment was to making a lot of money and again i don't want to be critical of that there could be you know Several of you in this room said, look, I really, you know, I want to make a lot of money out of screenwriting and show me the way to do that. And I'm, I'm totally down with that. I'm not going to be critical of that. There's, you know, there's, there's absolutely more than room for them in, in, in the industry. But what I'm saying is the process might be something that might be um, not altogether enjoyable. And this guy did it. it. It certainly worked out for him. He took a lot of other risks, personal financial risks, getting Star Wars made. But 
purely from the screenwriting perspective, perspective, he he hated it. But you know, he's a trillionaire, so he's not exactly too worried. Um, okay. Um, for this journey. Okay. Uh, you greatly. This is a sort of a non sequitur, really, but. You greatly enhance your chances of getting made if you write a role that will entice a bankable actor to participate for half their usual salary. I'm specifically talking about stars who have made a lot of money playing action heroes and are desperate to show their range as actors by doing something different. So if you think about, let's say, as an example, uh, Mel Gibson, after he'd done the legal, Lethal Weapon franchise films, and he wanted to really, you know, show that he could do different things and and you know show his range so then he went the next film he did was um hamlet directed by franco zeffirelli so it doesn't get much more different ironically they're apparently that they're making another one of these little weapon thingies right now so um um what comes around but um again that's that's uh that strategic thinking by by writers you know which which like Daniel Craig right now, um, having just done Bond to Bond to Bond, made a colossal amount of money. He's like on stage right now. He's looking to do more, I don't want to say art house projects, but projects that take him in different directions. And and because it also gets you know boring for actors just to do the same thing as uh, over and over again, and they get typecast. So again, if you if you're looking at doing something, and you talk, you know, you're keen on writing for a certain writer, for instance. Just factor these things in; it'll make it'll make a difference. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna skip that bit. <laughs> um, ideas. Uh, another great way of enhancing your chances of success is to base your script on. Uh, this is actually very important. On either news on a newspaper article, a play, a novel. Um, because these already have an inbuilt audience. So some form of brand recognition, which makes the project more interesting to um, producers uh, and executives. So as, as we were saying, Hampton Fancher went and uh, uh, optioned Philip K. Dick's uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, uh, which gave us two Blade Runner films. Um, a lot of people do that. And, you might say, well, I can't afford to go and option a book or an article and so on. You have no idea how many really good books fall between the cracks out there. Um, it's quite amazing. So you can definitely find a book that is done fairly well out there that has a form brand recognition that presents, provide, provides with some very interesting characters. And um, you will be able to option those and, um, and base your, your scripts on, on that. And same with the articles, plays. Um, a um, lot of plays for one reason or another. I mean, I'm surprised that, for instance, they haven't made a film of uh, Jez Butterworth's Jerusalem, or have they? Have I missed the boat? And I don't think they have, have they? No. I mean, that to me is like some of the most amazing writing in the last 20 years, and hasn't been turned to film yet. So there's ways of, of getting um, a head start by doing this. The, somebody, my research has, has revealed that something like 80% of blockbuster movies have that in their DNA, either based on a comic book character or like Mario Puzo's um, Godfather or uh, Peter Benchley's Jaws. Um, it's quite rare in a blockbuster realm for it to come from a, um, an original script. I think Back to the Future was an original script and they had a hell of a time setting that up. It was turned down by everybody. And it wasn't until um, a certain Mr. Spielberg came up, who, as I mentioned beforehand, was part of that University of Southern California groupies, uh, that they um, that they got the Blade Runner, um, Back to the Future made, and then you know they did at least what three of those things. One of the most successful franchises ever. So again, if you want to enhance your chances of success, that's that's one way of, of going about it. OK. Um, don't copy last year's hit. By the time you finish your script, the market will have been flooded with clones. OK, people do not want to see the same genre over and over again. They want variety. A sci fi film followed by a thriller, a Western. My, my advice is in the subtext of your script, 
script, ask some serious questions, be about politics, ecology, relationships, the law, situations people find themselves in, questions they ask themselves, make a statement, something people can relate to. It's probably one, I keep going to and fro with the, the producer of Blade Runner and the, the screenwriters and so why, why is 40 years later, why is this movie still relevant? Why are the new generations gravitating towards this, this film? And uh, why is this thing still, still relevant? And it's because it has all of these things about what is it to be a human being? What is it, you know, as issues of slavery, obviously, as ecological issues and so on and so forth. So that's why it, it's, it's, it's an evergreen. It keeps, it, it just doesn't date many ways. And uh, that's why you know people keep coming back to it. So again, if in the subtext of your script you can layer in issues like that, obviously don't make them too topical. So you know, if you're going to talk about war, Ukraine, so on, make it very metaphorical because if the war is hopefully over next month or whatever, then your script is automatically dated. So just be 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 you know be subtle about it. Don't put something in it that is going to date your script and they're going to say you know that's um, that's no longer relevant. Um, I think we should move on to the next slide. Let me see. If, okay. All right. Um, you know, um, read the trace. So, done. How many of you know of Done Deal Pro? Okay, that is really, really important. Done Deal Pro lists the scripts I've been selling, and usually has log lines, and so that will tell you what is selling to whom. And that also is a great way of avoiding um, writing something that's just sold to somebody else. Um, so I would highly recommend that you get into that. Um, truth be told, also you need to factor in the following that. We all think that we hatch unique ideas all the time. We don't. People tend to read the same books, uh, newspapers, etc. We are subject to the same zeitgeist. So do not be surprised to find out that the unique idea you were developing was also being worked on by several others. So at times you get into a situation where studios end up buying two or three screenplays about the same theme at the same time, um, competing ones, and usually only one ever gets made. Um, but uh, don't be surprised that happened. Don't immediately assume that you know you, somebody's gone and ripped you off. Uh, it, it just you know we just gravitate towards the same news and and uh, storytelling. So you know that happens quite a lot. Um, what is really important is, as I mentioned before, <clears throat> surround yourself with a good support team of other writers and give each other feedback, but make sure people have been trained to give feedback. Bad feedback is worse than none. I recently did a, um, uh, uh, an MA in um, uh, 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 biography writing at some university, I should mention, and um, you got a lot of feedback from people, um, but on the whole, People had me trained to give feedback. So, you know, the most dominant people in the room kind of affected everybody's uh, writing. And at times it was it was just, you might as well have gone down to the pub and gotten feedback from somebody there on, on your screen. So it's very important to, to, be, to know how to give feedback, to be supportive and to, to do it correctly, because otherwise it can, you know, you get these instances of people saying, well, you know, I was following so-and-so's advice, but you know, <laughs> It was rubbish advice. Um, always try and get, if you can, feedback from people in the industry. Through social media, that's become so much easier to do. There's, you should all have LinkedIn accounts that connect with all sorts of filmmakers all over the place, Facebook and so on and so forth. And you'd be surprised the number of people who will actually respond to a query. As long, I get queries all the time. And there's the people telling, sending me a life story. I mean, on LinkedIn, that's not easy to do. But it's like, you know, 16 paragraphs about this film they've written and blah, 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 help me do it and so on and so on. I'm never going to read it. Again, what you need there is your, your elevator pitch, you know, to get people, people interested. And be kind and supportive. And um, but, I mean, that's, you know, I ended up, that's how I got in touch with all these people from, you know, Blade Runner and, and, and all these amazing films because through social media, you know. So um, the trades also... Don't go crazy, but again, it's really Hollywood Report and Variety tend to list the scripts I've sold, right? So in terms of log lines, in terms of getting an idea where the industry is at, what they're buying, uh, you know, what is getting made and so on and so forth. That's, that's, again, the last thing you want to do is 
invest a year of your life writing a screenplay that from the get go, somebody would have told you, look, this is not going to fly. All right. So do your research. And part of your research is definitely looking at these trades and done deal. Um, this is also very important. Study the careers of writers that you respect. Obviously, read their scripts as much as possible. See what they are writing, selling, who their agents are, the mistakes they make. You learn a lot more from mistakes than you do from success stories. As, as I just mentioned, try to connect with them through social media, at film festivals, industry events. Um, a lot of writers have assistants. So, you know, they might respond. And, you know, why don't you see if you can get an assistant's job working for a major writer? There's, there's a few better ways of learning how to how to write than to work for, you know, some top top notch person um, doing their thing. Um, writers get to a stage where they think, OK, I'm done. Um, let's let's release this to the industry and and uh, and uh, get it out to people. And my advice to you is, and this is something I've briefly mentioned before, is when you think you're finished, organize a table read with the most experienced actors you can possibly find. Uh, don't forget to feed them. That's very important. Um, listen to their feedback. Integrate the notes. You will you integrate the notes that you feel will make the script better. This is a very important thing about integrating feedback from people. You as the writer, it's your voice. Don't try and please everybody. Just be selective enough. Just use the bits that you personally think um, will enhance the quality of your script. Okay. Don't try and integrate everybody's ideas. Um, so you've done your table read, you're kind of, OK, I need to let go. Let's so let's have the agent conversation and uh, literary manager and so on and so forth. So from my experience, and I was one, <laughs> there are two types. There's the fairly ineffectual ones who sign a lot of people in the hope that someone will find work. All right. So it's like you'll throw the spaghetti against the wall and hope that something will stick. Uh, routine, uh, Broadway, Danny Rose got the agent agenting. The, the other type of agent has a major track record, represents key talent, and can call decision makers directly. By that, I mean major producers, directors, actors, and studio executives, all of whom can get your script made. By the way, being represented by a well-known agent will also get you a lot more money than a lower profile one for the same, for the same um, project. It's just one of these weird things about the industry. If somebody from a major agent from CAA calls up on your behalf, apart from with all the enhanced credibility, um, people will not actually dare to offer that agent less than a certain amount of money. Whereas if it's little, you know, Joey, whatever, down the road with uh, your half an office, you know, somewhere in Burbank making a call on behalf for the same project, you will get a fraction of that, of that money. It's hard to explain this just the way it is. Um, the trouble with the effective agent, which is basically the agent you want to be with, is that he or she is unlikely to take you on unless you really impress them. By that, I mean you need to either win a screenwriting contest, be recommended by major talent, uh, or make an award-winning short. In essence, agents want clients for whom the bell, for whom the phones ring. Okay, uh, I stole that line. You can tell where. Um, that is that is very because as I said, I'm on my fourth agent in in, in two years. And I've seen a lot of people kill their careers because they say, hey, I've got an agent, the agent take care of it. <clears throat> Effective agents do not want to make calls on your behalf or as, as few calls as, as possible. They want the kind of clients that are so well known, so good, so effective that all of these other people in the industry call up to see if they can work with them. That is that is their MO. Um, so if you want to keep your agent, you need to network like a maniac. Again, go to film festivals, industry events, screenings. If you meet a producer and tell them you are with such and such agent, you will have instantaneous credibility. If there's an offer of work, immediately pass it on to your agent to negotiate. In the US, agents spend a lot of time poaching others' clients. I've lost several clients that way, which is really annoying. There's a lot less of that in the UK because apparently it's not, uh, it's, it's not allowed. Um, agents. Um, yeah, okay. One of the key re reasons agents do not want to take on new clients is loyalty. This is something that writers need to know. If, the, if they sign someone with talent but need to teach them the ropes for six months or so, 
there's a good chance that once the writers start selling, that they will be headhunted by another agent at the bigger agency. So the agents do not want to do that anymore. I learned that lesson the hard way when I, when, when I was an agent. So um, because they are working for you for free for, I don't know, six months or whatever to get you up to speed, they're basically losing money. And if they get you up to a certain stage, I did that. Again, I can't mention any some, some very prominent writers. And, um, you know, I spent six months getting up to getting them up to a professional standard. The first screenplay sells and some big agent from CAA or ICM or whatever, you know, uh, calls up and says, hey, you know, um, you know, very often they will leave and go with the big agents. And I'm kind of going, well, you know, I can't. It doesn't make sense for me to support writers anymore in, 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 for those first six months. It just doesn't make economic sense. And also emotionally, it's it, it's problematic when you work very closely with someone for a certain amount of time and then they just, you know, <clears throat> uh, toddle off into the, uh, you know, into the distance with, with some other agencies. It's just, it's just, it takes a toll as a, as a, as a, as a, as a human beings as well. So, so if somebody reaches out to you, always take care of the people who give you breaks in the industry. That is, that is, that is huge. There will be, sadly, there won't be many who will give you a break, but the ones who do will will help you get careers. And if they have helped you, always take care of them. Okay, so even for some reason, the agent has given you a career and you want to go to a bigger agency because that agency can package. Does everybody know what packaging means? Okay, packaging basically means you have an agency that is so big that they have A-list writers, directors, actors, so they can put the entire picture together inside the agency and then they take it to the studios. Um, even so, if, even if a client wants to go to an agency, they could not obviously, there's only a handful of agencies who are big enough to be able to package them. So um, even if the writer says, look, oh, I need to go to a bigger agency because they can package my product, my, my script and so on and, and get it made. Always take care of your people. You might want to continue commissioning that person. You might want to, you know, um, keep them in the loop, bring them in as a producer and so on and so forth. I, I, the people who do that tend to have longer careers. They have, word gets round about what it's like. If you've written a script or you directed something, or you've had a first starring role, trust me, for your next day, the first thing people are gonna do, agents, producers, blah, 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 they're gonna call up the first bunch of people you work with. What's it like working with this person? Happens all the time. I've, I've known a lot of people who never, despite all their talent, despite all their talent, I was working with one guy who was a Academy nominated short filmmaker and so on and so forth, because of their bad behavior, because they didn't take care of people, because they were disloyal. They never got to do another movie as a result. So the industry is is um, kind of pretty protective on that front. So um, so be kind, reach out to people, make sure they're taken care of. If somebody's giving you a break, it it's, makes all the difference. And it's just a nicer way of living, truth be told. Um, another option in terms of representation is literary managers. Um, they are better. They're actually a better starting point for new writers. They can do pretty much the same thing as agents, but they cannot negotiate on your behalf. So they get a lawyer to do that. OK, uh, they tend to be more focused on the long term, i.e. if you need several months help to get your script up to speed, they will often work with you. Uh, managers also have a wide network and can help you get an agent. They can also produce which agents legally are not allowed to do. They can also be, um, managers can produce and help you get your project made. Agents, as I said, are not allowed to produce, but it's a wild, wild west. I mean, at least in Los Angeles. So I know a number of agents who actually have produced and um, um, that creates um, serious conflict, interest, conflict of interest. Um, it's a very big fellow I was involved with. Um, I found out that the agent representing the client, the writer, was also busy negotiating an executive producer credit for herself with the studio, which is just beneath the pale. I mean, it's just you can't do that because if you are getting a payday from the studio, then from a legal perspective, you can't ex be expected to do right by the writer and get them the most amount of money for their project in the best, best, best terms. 
if if you're at the same time an employee of the studio. It, it doesn't make sense. So um, she did it, and I I complain about it, but it's as I said, it's it's wild wild west. And the 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 writer was also meant to direct the picture. The reason why it went to a specific studio was because they had made noises about also letting him direct. And this guy was a hyper successful advertising director you know like all these guys like really scott and so on they all came out of advertising in, in their day this guy was one of those i mean multiple award-winning uh advertising director and there's no way this guy was going to do a bad show um a bad um, directing test so they 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 invited him to the studio to do a directing test and he did this thing and they basically said no sorry you're not good enough and we need to apply another dire uh, director to us and this was all part of the collateral damage of not having his agent do what she was meant to do, fully protect him. Because as I said, there's no way that this guy did a bad um, uh, directing test for the studio. So if you ever find out that it's a legitimate question to ask, if you have a literary manager, they are allowed to produce, clarify that in terms of what is your relationship going to be on my script uh, with the studio or whatever, just, just ask them and say, no, Talk to me about the parameters of your involvement with this with, with this project. With your agent, it's always a good idea and a nice way to ask, but I assume you're not involved in, in producing this or any of your colleagues or you know nobody else. Again, anything that can smell of conflict of interest. Ask in a nice way. You don't want to take them off, but just ask them in a nice way to ensure that you're fully taken care of, that your rights are being protected, that the full potential of the project is being exploited to your advantage as the originator of, of the script. Um, lawyers, actually, these days, a lot of lawyers for various reasons are setting up shop and they're doing pretty much the same thing as the literary managers are doing. So that's another port of call as well. And lawyers are actually quite easy to get to and probably, you know, um, again, probably a little bit easy to get a good lawyer or solicitor to re represent you than um, probably on a par with literary managers, but definitely easier than getting an agent. Um, many of them operate like managers these days. They're also very well connected and help can help you secure a manager and or agent. And they also have access to producers, actors, directors, etc. cetera. So uh, you always have to make sure whatever contract you sign that they are vetted by a lawyer. That's that's really important. Don't sign any option agreements, etc., <coughs> that are downloaded from the internet. All your paperwork needs to be assumable by production companies and the studios. Do you know what assumable means? No. Assumable means that your the paperwork you sign, be it option agreements, be it sale agreements, be whatever it is they ask you to sign, needs to be of a quality. And it needs to be studio standard. So if it is something downloaded from the internet or it is legally uh, compromised, then um, a good lawyer can poke a hole in it, can invalidate the contract. So if your paperwork isn't of an adequate standard for a studio, they, they can say, well, you don't actually have a proper option on this thing, or you can, People, I've seen it happen a lot actually when they try legally try and undermine projects, and um, because the the rights transition from you as the writer to the producer or the studio so on has to be watertight. And if there's some problem with the paperwork, so that you know when they give you the check, they there's reason to believe that the rights are not fully because you have so many rights. This rights not just you know, video streaming, there's the sequels, there's gaming, toys, uh, theme parks. I mean, it is virtually endless nowadays. And if that is not done correctly, then then people can challenge and say, well, you know, you don't own the rights to this, or we can't buy the script from you. You need to go back to to, to square one and get the paperwork so that, which can be very expensive at that, that stage when somebody's interested. Also, it shows a lack of professionality. If you come up with something downloaded uh, from the internet to provide, you know, evidence for this, that, and the other, and they look at it and kind of, it's kind of dodgy, then you don't look good. Okay, you always at all times want to look as professional as, as, as possible. So, you know, if it's a question of three, 400 pounds spent on a solicitor to make sure your paperwork is of a certain quality, it's money well spent. 
Um, when you get an offer for representation, especially with agents, um, I had one writer who, really, really smart guy, who wrote this incredible horror piece. And this is the guy I've been out in the, out in the cold for many years. You know, he's been writing for at least six, seven, eight years. No one's showing any interest. He suddenly goes and wins this contest. And um, all these people suddenly become interested because he used that contest meeting to call up a bunch of agencies and so on and so forth. And they said, hey, okay, yeah, we'll take a meeting with you and so on and so forth. So he, um, he got an offer from this agency, quite a decent mid-level agency to take him on. And uh, but at that stage, he was kind of full of himself. I mean, he was kind of going, you know what? I can get CAA, I can get ICM, I can get the really top agencies. So instead of saying, yeah, I'll take it, I'll go with you, he just said, yeah, okay, I'll get back to you. And then he went and took the meetings with all these uh, other guys. And I say ICM, CA, all the, you know, um, top agencies, that just, they might take a meeting with you, they're not going to send you on until you have a body of work. And then uh, a few days passed, and he went back to the agent who had uh, made him the offer, and uh, the guys, and he said, okay, I'll take it. And I said, I'm no longer interested. With agents, it's, it's a gut thing very often. It's instinctive can be quite emotional. If an agent makes you an offer representation, truth be told, if you don't accept it pretty fast, they're gonna kind of go, you know what? Maybe this person's going to be hard to work with. You know what? This is gonna be, you know, I'm, my gut feeling tells me. I've definitely turned on people on, on the basis of my gut instinct, without doubt. Um, so if you have an agent, it is much, much, much easier to upgrade and, and go up the food chain. If, if we need that to happen down the road. It is much more difficult to get a new agent if you're basically don't have an agent. So you're like you're swimming in the water, hoping a ship will come along and pick you up. And you know it's much easier to jump from one ship to the other ship. So if somebody makes you an offer to represent you, um, and it's a halfway decent a agency, and you know that the agent is, is competent, has a track record, always check people out. Don't wait too long. Uh, 24 hours tops. Seriously, don't don't wait any longer because that uh, that offer will go away. And like this guy, I think he's also one of those selling shoes somewhere in Montana. Uh, it's as he um, he blew it, despite that really great script, he blew it. Um, so it's amazing. Doors take a long time to open, then they open quite rapidly, and then boy, they close really quickly as well if you don't um, make the right moves. Um, back to the legal business quickly. Uh, no handshake deals. Uh, without a contract, you will not remember what you agreed to six months down the road. It's it, dishonesty and all that kind of stuff aside. You actually won't remember what you agreed to with that person in terms of what you get paid um, for the actual option, how long the option is for, um, you know, um, rewrites, how much do you get to do a rewrite on the script, the time factors, you just don't remember. So always exchange paperwork. Um, if you want to work with someone and they're not prepared to sign an agreement detailing the terms, my advice to you is walk. Don't do it. Life's too short. I've seen a lot of people get into, into sort of, they have a script, it's been with one person, they have a sort of handshake agreement, they want to move to the next person who is prepared to give them a proper option agreement with money and so on and so forth. The first person kicks up a fuss saying, no, we have a verbal agreement. Verbal agreements very often are, don't want to say binding, but they, they can be enough of a headache. And very often the second people who are real who want to give you a contract, they'll walk because there's uh, there's something on peg, it's uh, unclear and so on and so forth. So you, so you definitely don't want somebody yapping at your heels at some stage when some big producer, big executive, someone coming to you, wanting to do business, saying yap, 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 yap. Uh, and very often they're actually holding out for, for, for a payday. So they want them, the second person to give the first person, you know, um, a decent amount of money to just make them go away. A lot of people make a lot of money, just this go away money. Don't do it. Don't do it. It's just not worth it. Um, so walk if there's there's no paperwork. Um, it's it's also amazing in the industry how some of the nicest people will certainly turn on you when there's money on the table. Um, no, I'm going to skip this story because we have so much to get through. Uh, Ask me later over a drink or something. Um, so register your script with the Writers Guild. 
Writers Guild West in the States. You can do it online. Um, so I think $20 or something so forth. But you're not taken care of. Um, if there's a lawsuit, and I've been involved in several lawsuits, clients, scripts, and all this kind of stuff, um, the judge will ask you um, keep all your notes, work in pro progress, uh, research any form of evidence that you are the creative force behind the uh, behind the project that it is your IP. So, just making a copy, handing it over to WGA, blah blah blah. Yeah, that's that's all very nice. That's that's what everyone does. But if you speak to a judge, if it goes to court, then that judge will want to see your notes, your work in progress, and so on and so forth to actually really prove that you you wrote this thing. Okay, so always keep keep your files. You all even research. Um, now, this is going to sound weird, but in order to make a living as a screenwriter, you need to be good, but not everyone is an Aaron Sorkin. So I, I used to represent a writer um, who was straight, what we used to call straight to video, so straight to streaming, or whatever you call it. And this guy, he was quite good, but he was no Aaron Sorkin. He'd write these kind of horror pieces and so on and so forth. You know, made for a million or two and so on. There's actually really in Roger Corman type territory. And uh, and there's a there's a big market for those things. You know, people want to want to want to see them. And he would churn out two or three scripts a year. I mean, literally, he would write a script in a month. Okay, and uh, and uh, he'd probably get about twenty thousand, thirty thousand per script. But if you do three of these things a year, and then you get your rewrites on top of it. So last time I checked with him, I think he had fifteen or sixteen films produced, which is you know. <coughs> John Tour Carriera side is, is very unusual these days. And he was happy with that. It's his living. He had no ambitions to become a big studio, this, that, and the other, and so on and so forth. So what I'm saying to you is um, it's it's okay. I mean, I'm trying to open your, your perspective in terms of the, the number of ways you can make a living out of, out of the industry. There's, there's all sorts of angles and so on and so forth. If you're not and few people are as good as an Aaron Sorkin, that's fine. There's other things to do. Don't don't shut the door on, on having careers as, as, a, as a writer. I was getting good money writing, <laughs> writing uh, silly dialogue for these talk show type things, you know, back in, and that was that was good money. It was complete rubbish. <laughs> I took the money and, uh, you know, paid my bills. So, um, um, yep. Shock. We've been speaking a little bit about potentially doing that. Do you think if you go in at that sort of level, kind of possible to then break out into doing the more serious Absolutely. stuff? Absolutely. Tarantino, Robert Rodriguez, Spike Lee, I mean, the, um, Matt Damon, Ben Affleck, um, uh, all these guys started really low budget. Well, I mean, Good Will Hunting wasn't that low budget, but you know what I'm saying is is absolutely that's what I'm saying to you. Make, but I'll get back to this later. But whatever you do, make it make it good. I mean, look at look at the number of people who started up working for Roger Corman. Uh, I mean, just an amazing um, Jonathan Demi, um, Jack Nicholson. I mean, some really amazing talent. Actors, writers, directors started up doing these micro budgeted things, and then they cut their teeth doing that stuff, and then they made all their beginners' mistakes, and the rest is history. So no, absolutely. Uh, I actually recommend you do that. But as I said, try to do micro budget, but there has to be something, there has to be a standout factor that will get you the industry interest. Say, well, hold on a second, you know, that's kind of, I don't know, schlocky horror, but it's really good schlocky horror. You know, let's let's give you 20 million to do it on a, on a much bigger scale. Um, no, there's masses of movies there. So no, I, I, I recommend that you do that. Absolutely. Um, Right. Um, so again, you know, make an effort to understand the industry, who is doing what, looking for a change of direction, look for opportunities. <clears throat> also about, you know, ask yourself, what can you do for them? You know, if, if, it's, if a producer or director is, is, is looking for a change of direction, so on, be aware of people's careers. Don't pitch a period piece to somebody, just straight up action, you know, always research the people you're going to be in contact with you know if you're going to a film fest and so on you know and there's ex people presenting look into their careers look at what they've done 
there'll, there'll be interviews telling you where they want to go, what they're looking for. Like I'm looking for this, the project I'm trying to do with Habib right now, I'm looking for a very good, very extremely visual sci-fi piece uh, for him to do because he said he has all this Blade Runner background and visual effects and so on. And we're having a devil all the time. We, <laughs> we had one script, but then the writers refused to meet with the head of the studio. Uh, don't ask and I won't tell. Um, okay, um, again, network. With the help of your peers, prepare the best elevator pitch. We've talked about this film festivals. Um, you know what I found out recently, and I've been a member of BAFTA for 2000 years, um, is BAFTA has really reached out to um, new screenwriters. There's a lot of programs at BAFTA. You don't need to be a BAFTA member. Um, they have all sorts of opportunities to go in there, do workshops and, and networking and so on and so forth. So look at their site. Um, uh, again, let me just elaborate on the um, networking front. Networking, networking is also a skill. I'm quite good at it, but there's some people who are like sublime. And um, um, a few years ago, um, Creative Artists Agency, which to this day is the biggest agency in Los Angeles, had an I Am Pay building in Beverly Hills. They had built for themselves. It's amazing. It's like a cathedral. And they had an entrance lobby, which was like, I don't know, four times the size of this room with multi-million dollar, you know, cooling paintings and all sorts of stuff in the one. And really, obviously, built to impress. Um, and there was a big industry event in there. I mean, everybody was in there, you know, people were like, you know, that lot. And uh, probably about 200 people. And I was with some friends. One was a very major director and then his assistant. And... I watched the assistant network this room. It was like Mozart, Beethoven in action. It was absolute, I was in awe of this guy. He went to every single person, I mean, every single person who mattered in that room. And he had an anecdote. He had, he knew about their latest project. He knew about their blasted kids that I had the flu. I mean, it was that level of detail. This guy had researched them and they all really appreciated that. I mean, the thing you have to understand with celebrities is if you got them and said, hi, great to see you again, they will never say, I have no idea who you are. They'll say, yeah, great to see you too. You know, it's, they have such a high volume. But as I said, watching this guy work this entire lobby, I said, four times the size of this room, having an anecdote, an exchange, uh, you know, an, an email address, a business card, whatever, with each one of these people was absolutely amazing. I, I, I never managed to get my game up to that to that standard. I, I, I did OK, but that, that guy was like in a, in, a, in a different league. So again, as a writer, unfortunately, you're not just a writer these days. As I keep saying, you're an entrepreneur, you're, you're self-employed and all this kind of networking and hype and PR and so on. It's, it's 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 part of it. It can be very frustrating, but that's the nature of the business. Um, OK, now I'm going to go on a rant. Um, development people. Have you heard of development people? Uh, OK, my advice to you is avoid anybody who has development in their title. Uh, <laughs> not missing my words. <laughs> Probably get hate mail after this. Uh, most development people have either read the McKeek book or done the course. This is how they will assess your script. And I will be talking about this in greater detail during the last lecture today, which is going to be the, the, the most intense lecture. I and mean, I'm just going to have to go through so much stuff there. So please have lots of coffee. Um, the average development executive has a lifespan of about four to five years. Uh, then they burn out. Uh, very few of them become, this is key, very few of them end up becoming producers, maybe 2%. They are known as, in the industry, they are known as no people. Um, I had an uh, ex-girlfriend who uh, was one of the top development people in, in Los Angeles, worked for that uh, Academy Award winning major director. Then she went and worked for a um, one of the biggest production companies in town that was good for about two theatrical films a month. I mean, she was top, top, top. And uh, she did this, I lost touch, but I think at that stage she did it for like eight years. And this, you got to understand, this is somebody who on a daily basis has the top screenplays from agencies on her desk, okay? And also um, top screenplays from you know, independent writers, contacts, networks, and so on and so forth. Um, hold on, but 
not forget my notes, otherwise I'm just going to. Um, so the question I eventually asked after eight years was, so out of, so this is reading maybe four screenplays a day. I mean, by that, I obviously mean they're not going to read them fully. Um, seven days a week. If you don't read the weekend, you don't have a job Monday. Um, so you work it out. Mathematics has been eight years of that. And I asked her, how many screenplays have you had optioned and made? She had had one movie of the week made and one other script optioned. That kind of traffic of, of, of screenplays. OK, so development people um, are in a volume game. How one of the ways they keep their jobs is by proving to their bosses that they have an amazing flow of screenplays coming through their turnstiles. So, and especially the really, I mean, a top notch development person is the kind of person who will get, you know, um, Stephen's Alien to send him or her their screenplay before anybody else has seen it. That, that those people are worth their weight in gold. And, and that's actually quite rare because Stephen's Alien is not going to do that because um, the agent will get really ticked off. Um, so they're in a volume game. That doesn't mean that they have any, in, any interest in anything but the very best written by produced authors. All right. So produced authors are always going to the top of the pile. Very often they will not have fully read your script and will pass on it because you are not a name writer. One of my favorite tricks when I was still submitted to these people was to ask them why they passed. They would usually respond with a cliched line out of McKee about the character arc or turning points or act breaks, blah, blah, blah. I would then, I eventually got wise to this business. And I would then press them and say something like, was it the character of Joey that did not work for you? Was his reaction to the shootout not credible? Nine out of 10 times they would say, yes, of course, there never was a character called Joey or a shootout in the script. See, that is just disrespectful. That is not cool. Uh, when when a writer puts so much time and effort into a script, the opportunity costs are immense. And most of us, when we sit down, we we write a script for uh, six months or a year. You know, we're not making any money, or we got a really nasty waitering job or whatever it is to to you know feed our habit. And there's a lot at stake for us. And when they treat us that way, I I lose it. I mean, I, I I've, I've read the right act to several of these people when I caught them doing that. Eventually I chilled out and just moved on. But there's, again, be empowered. If somebody is disrespecting you as a writer, don't, I, and I repeat myself because I need to repeat myself. If somebody turns you down, that doesn't mean you just turn around and walk away. Make your case, be aggressive in a pleasant way. Um, uh, and don't put up this kind of nonsense. You know, ask people, say, okay, why specifically have you passed on my screenplay? And feel free to throw this kind of Joey line in there to make sure that they actually read it. And yeah, I've humiliated a couple of them through that, and I was good doing it. Uh, you know. <laughs> um, I actually had a friend. <laughs> I told you I'm going to go on a rant. I had a friend of mine who worked at Columbia, was a development executive at Columbia, and his job was actually, and this is serious, he would read all these screenplays and he said, okay, 15% of the script is like um, Dot Strange, 17% of the script is like Blade Runner, 28% is like Ghostbusters, whatever, 28% of Ghostbusters meant so much in the box of this. 17% so much at the box office, 15% the box office. So he would actually go back. And this is the truth. He was getting paid big bucks at Columbia to assess screenplays that way. <laughs> so he would go back to the executive and say, accordingly, all these percentiles, this movie will make $375 million at the box office. That was actually a job. So <laughs> this is one of the few moments that I'm actually speechless about <laughs> stuff that goes on in the industry. Um, major writer mistakes to avoid. So a lot of writers who suddenly, you know, have interest in their work and so on, the, the, at times this is a sort of disconnect with reality. So the script goes out, there's an offer. It's an offer for, I don't know, it's your first screenplay and they, they offer you an option, uh, a, a, a sale price of $300,000 of which you will get option monies, you know, upfront is usually about 10%. So you get $30,000 for year one and maybe another $30,000 per year. 
I've seen a number of people go back to agents and say, what do you mean three hundred thousand dollars? You know, eh, scripts. They, nothing sells below a million dollars. I want at least a million dollars for my screenplay. And this is this is not um, this is not an exception. It happens all of the time. You know, writers only kind of, dude, you've never made any money out of your screenwriting. Take the three hundred. Take it. And so many times, no, I want better. I want better. And quite a few of them actually blew the three hundred because the offer wasn't on the table. Blah blah blah. Like you know, it went away. Um, so if somebody, if the company is halfway as credible, there are no competing offers. Take it, get your first movie made, move on, and uh, and uh, you know build on that. The essence is become a produced writer. Um, so we got that one out of the way. That every script sells for a million bucks. Um, what? I mean, also you know they they don't make that kind of money. That's why when a script sells for so much money, it's in the news. Um, and also, don't forget all of these sale prices you were reading the trades and so on, trades and so on, or budgets for movies or actors' salaries. Trust me, I've been on the on the other side of the equation. So much, so much of it is hype, and hype is the fuel on which the film industry industry runs. So if you say, look, um, you know, such and such actor is getting paid a uh, million dollars to be in this movie, <laughs> who cares? But if they say he's getting thirty million. Or she's getting thirty million. That wow, that's that's press. Or if they say, you know, the budget of this movie is eighty million dollars. Who cares? If they say the budget is three hundred and fifty million dollars, uh, you got people's interest. So ergo, uh, you know, um, a lot of prices are are inflated. So when you hear a lot of this stuff going on about, you know, uh, so and so just got paid a trillion dollars for a TV series, uh, bucket of salt. Um, uh, so again, if somebody's prepared to produce your script and they're credible, go with them unless you have a better offer. Don't get pressures. Same with agents. If you get an offer representation, go for it. Um, again, my advice is uh, avoid development people. Uh, writing partnerships, quick uh, anecdote on that. As I, I was mentioning, my guide Fox, who, who did that movie with the writing partner and then they split up. The problem is, does anybody know about the quote system in the film industry? Quotes, quotes, okay. Quote is basically, if you don't have a quote, they will try and pay you a writer's guild minimums, which are, I don't know, depending on the size of the budget, thirty, sixty thousand dollars or something. If you have a quote, which basically means that your last screenplay sold for two hundred thousand dollars, that's your quote. And very often, whoever is bidding to buy your next screenplay will have to top your quote. That's ju that's just just the way it goes. Um, so, hold on. Um, if you're on a writing team and you split up, you go back to zero. So you're back to writer's scale minimum. And because your, 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 your former colleague is going to say, I did all the writing, and you're going to say, I did all the writing. So the executives and the producers are going to say, we don't know who did any of the writing. So you're down to zero. So if you're going to work with somebody, and I'm, I'm totally in favor of writing teams, there's some really great writing. Don't just say, I'm going to do it for my movie. It has to be a long-term relationship. OK, because otherwise that can really affect the, the financials of what you do. Um, do not be genre cast. Unless you want to spend the rest of your life writing rom coms, make sure you don't do more than a couple. I was just telling a few guys out there, um, I, I was representing this um, Emmy winning comedy writer and um, TV, and he wrote a very good um, comedy screenplay film. And I started passing around people and they just looked at the name and said, no, the guy's a TV writer. I'm not interested. The guy's a TV writer. The, guy, the guy's a TV writer. So they didn't respond to his writing and uh, nothing to do with the script. Brilliant script. Emmy writing comedy. The guy wrote mostly a lot of jokes for the Academy Awards when they were still funny. Um, he, um, he couldn't get further with, it with his uh, comedy screenplay because that's, again, one of these weird things about the industry that you need to know. Um, so I mentioned the business about feedback on your scripts. Again, don't make the mistake. Try and get industry pros or people you know are trained or really know what they're talking about. Don't take any feedback just because it's feedback. Just make sure it's as good of quality as you can get. Um, don't rely on your representation. Your agent is not your friend. Most will dump a new writer. The script does not sell within half a dozen submissions. All right. <clears throat> Most agents will take on a new writer for a specific project. If it sells great, what else have you got? If not, bye bye. 
Um, I'll skip that story as well. Um, if you have interest in your project, be easy to work with. I, I briefly discussed that people, you know, will call about you. Um, so there's this guy I was working with again, briefly mentioned him who had an um, who had an academy nomination for a short and uh, he got picked up by a major production company and they gave him a really decent first film with some really good actors. Uh, the film was pretty good, came out, but he, he'd been such a prima donna on the set that every time subsequent producers called up that production company to see what it was like working with Mr. X, they would say no comment, which is about as, as, as damning uh, uh, you know, a thumbs down as you can get in, in the industry. It took them six years to get another uh, film done, and that was because um, a friend of mine helped him out, and he's kind of been stuck in the B genre ever since, having started off as, a, as an Academy-nominated um, director for his thing. So again, good behavior. Um, it's kind of ratish behavior. A lot of these people indulge in. I just don't get that. I mean, yeah. um, so be good to work. If, um, OK, so again, how to protect yourselves. When you're invited to a producer and director meeting with six or more people around the table firing ideas at you, and this is the norm nowadays, by the way, OK? Um, take all the ideas down, nod and thank them. Then go away and integrate only the ones you think make the script better. OK, but nod and thank them. Don't don't make them feel that they're, they're being ignored. Um, when you go back with your rewrites, say thank you so much for the great input has made the, the script so much better because guess what? They don't remember what they've thrown you away. OK. Um, I had. Uh, uh, you see, you need these anecdotes, otherwise it's just kind of a guy talking about the industry. The, the, the case studies are what, what brings it to life. So this one guy who had a pilot for um, a, a TV series, and uh, we got him a very good, very experienced um, executive producer. Executive producer are the key people, obviously, in, in television. And he went to pitch this to CBS, and the proverbial top people around the table, and they were like, put in my idea, put in my idea. You know? And this poor guy, he hadn't been prepared by this by this executive producer, she should have sat him down before and said, dude, listen, nod, you know. So this poor guy, he was like avidly taking notes and notes and notes and notes. And then he went away and he tried to address and integrate every single idea into the script. So what happened? His voice completely fell apart. There was no through line. It was just a bunch of ideas that were like not really interconnected. Great ideas, but if they're not interconnected, it, it's it's pointless, and so the um, the uh, the pilot did get picked up, and it, it did get made. And I was he threw a big party in the cell. We went to watch it, and it was like it was really bad. It was really bad, and it started off with a truly excellent premise that could have gone to multiple years of you know series, and and uh, because. He had not been protected because he tried to please every executive in the room. The thing just fell apart, and that was that. Was that. So again, be wise. <clears throat> um, so again, and I'm repeating myself, um, my solution is think like a filmmaker, write a great short or full-length feature film that can be shot for little money. Uh, look at how people like Spike Lee, Tarantino, Robert Rodriguez, Matt Damon, Ben Affleck, all of these guys started off. Virtually every screenwriter who has a career has been turned down multiple times by production companies, agencies, and the studios. As I mentioned, the guys who wrote uh, uh, Back to the Future got turned down by every studio in town some twice. Um, <laughs> the, the, the Bob Gale story I love is when, when they went to Disney and they, they showed the script uh, for... for Back to the future, the Disney, the, the Disney executive said, we're Disney and you bring us a story about incest. <laughs> um, again, I was talking to some of you guys out there. The industry is not set up to be a meritocracy. It is hard for good people to rise to the top. Some of the best writers I've met are painting houses and selling shoes. I'm sadly being totally forthright about that. Team up with talented people from school showcases are a really great place. Short film festivals <clears throat> also. Um, what do you need to make a film? You don't need a deal. You don't need an agent, posh offices. You need lights, cameras, sound equipment, post-production facilities. Think like filmmakers, people. That, that makes all the difference in having a career. 
Um, if you have a good script, it is amazing how supported the industry can be. Uh, talk to people, e equipment hire people will give you a break off season, post production. If you need to edit your picture, you know a lot of people will give new filmmakers their facilities for free. If you took take the graveyard shift, so you go in the midnight to five o'clock in the morning, you get access to millions of pounds dollars worth of editing equipment. Um, you know that's if you get it for free, do it. Um, and 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 actors always the casting process is really key i've made some major mistakes in casting in the in the past and and uh, and uh, um uh, you know if you can get some really good like i did got this guy the gym the royal shakespeare company guy and so on um so one of the reasons why star wars did so well is because they had um not Lawrence Olivier, who did they have in there? Um, Guinness. Alec Guinness. As soon as Alec Guinness said he'd do the picture, several of the other actors said, well, if he's doing it, I need to be in this thing. And he elevated the quality of acting in that picture to the, ex to the other extent. You, on the whole, it happens in a lot of movies, look at them. You will have one actor who's a lot better than anybody else, and all the others will want to learn from him or her and, and up their game as a result. That's actually huge. So very often you can't afford a room full of really great actors, but if you just get one in there who's very well respected by the others, the quality of the movie tends to be a lot better. And that also helps if you're writing a screenplay for a particular actor, um, get them involved. It's amazing how hands-on, because actors, bankable actors know bankable actors. They know directors. It's it's a fairly small community. So you go up to them. We're, we've, I've, I've had that happen in several instances. That's how Tarantino got his first movie, Reservoir Dogs made. Is is you know he appealed to certain actors and said, you know that can do a lot for my career, and so they go to bat for you. It's it's really. But you're talking to creatives. You're not talking to a bunch of suits as we call them. Uh, you know, executives, agents, and producers types of songs. Creatives talking to creators, and then they suddenly get a package that's worth 10, 15 million, but they only need 3 million. And then those people, obviously, distributors and so on, becoming um, interested, and you get a film made. Do we have any questions, by the way? I'm just kind of going on and on at this stage. Is there anything unclear or go? How much of the section do you Yeah, I mean, I keep telling you, it's, it's, you can't just be a screenwriter these days. You need your network, you need your, you need a good director to work with, maybe write for that director. You need a good actor. You need you need you need a support system. There's days where you can just, as a writer, isolate yourself in some you know garret with your laptop and, and write away happily. You also you know it's a very solitary, lonely occupation. And having that kind of creative input, you know, Hampton Fancher in, interacting with Ridley Scott, you know, pot of soup on the stove. You know, doing this this exercise, you know, it's you know, what I'm saying interacting with other people, it just it takes you to the next level. So yeah, you have to, you have to um, uh, engage with others. You have to go to film festivals. You have to go to screenings. You because, you know, it's 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 a networking. It's the nature of the beast. It's not just about creative input, but also about getting your your script to the right people and getting it made. So yeah, it's. I would say, truth be told, probably nowadays, 70% is, is to do with what you need to do to write a really good screenplay, your research and, and table reads and all this kind of stuff, and probably at least 30% is networking. It's just the reality of it. Once you get into it, once you get the hang of networking and, and this kind of schmoozing and interacting with people, it just becomes second nature. It's actually quite enjoyable. Um, Seriously, it is. <laughs> you give me that look. <laughs> OK. Um, OK, so again, um, any any questions, anything that is any other questions that is unclear? Yeah. Um, well, obviously, quite a lot of the advice you've given is very film industry specific, you know, like what to do with the producer director meeting. So. Um, I mean, it does strike me that quite a lot of the stuff applies to almost any part of the literary world. That's a fair comment. Yeah, it's, um, yes. Um, I, I've just, um, the reason I've had been through four agents in the last two years is because I'm, I'm in the process of actually writing a book, a biography. So I've been dealing with the publishing industry. And you're, you're totally right. 
um, the days when publishers were just looking for good books are pretty much over. Um, they want the ancillary rights to sell. They want TV rights, film rights, translation rights, and all this kind of stuff. So the way I managed to get, because I'm a former agent, so I know how to game the system. So, you know, I had multiple agents offering to uh, represent me, um, which doesn't mean I always made the right decision. <laughs> but uh, no, you're, you're totally right. Um, it's, it's, um, first of all, so many of the publisher companies have been bought up and they've been all bought out by conglomerates. And there's usually a, a big studio involved in one of those things. So the food chain has become a lot tighter. So Paramount owns publishing and Warner's owns publishing, Universal owns publishing. It's just the name of the game. Um, so um, unless higher up in the food chain basically says, yeah, you know, buy this script or buy this book or whatever, because various other parts of the company can also make money out of it. Then, uh, so the way I got all these agents was I, I put out all the marketing stuff up front. I had quotes from, you know, about the book I'm writing from The Economist, The New York Times, The Guardian, the, you know, because I went in an option, basically um, a biography of somebody, a well-known entity. And I was writing uh, about them. And um, and uh, I didn't really go into it with the, um, um, you know, this is a really great story. Here's my writing. So my writing actually sample came right at the very end. I had to create a 70 page um, proposal, publishing proposal. And um, all the stuff up front was all marketing. How the film's going to get made, quotes. I got, I got a bunch of people, well known industry people, to read some of my stuff and give me quotes, one liners. And I'd get all these phone calls from agents. And I can guarantee you they hadn't read the writing sample. So, yeah, absolutely. It's. Um, um, what is really scary is I used to go to a lot of um, publishers' um, conventions, you know, like in, in London and Frankfurt, book fairs and all this kind of stuff. And I, I talk to people and I say, I would say literally like, well, you know, um, so this, this writer is really hot and you're looking for this, that and the other. And I would quote a couple of well-known writers, like I don't know, someone like F. Scott Fitzgerald or something like that. And the number of these publishing people on the other side of the table, I'm not kidding you, we've never heard of F. Scott Fitzgerald or, or people of that ilk. Well, it was just frightening. It was just frightening. It was really kind of depressing, actually. Um, one of my favorite stories, back to the film work, um, film world. Um, are you all aware of a 1970s, 60s actor, a guy called Steve McQueen, The Great Escape? Okay, so, um, this is one of my name drop type little stories. Um, I was um, trying to get a film made by Michael Madsen. Michael Madsen, as again, is the guy who helped um, Tarantino get a couple of his movies made because he got involved and said, hey, let me take it to these other guys. So we're sitting in his beach house in Malibu, obviously, and uh, this one of his neighbors shows up and um, we start talking. And the way people bond in the industry very often is by you, you exchange horror stories. <laughs> So we started, and I told him my horror story du jour, and he started and responded. And then you always try to up each other, say, "Now nah, my experience is far worse." <laughs> so Steve McQueen was his father, right? This is this is Scott. Scott, I think it's Scott McQueen is his first first name. You'll probably see me now because I got it wrong. Um, and he was telling me that he'd just been to Universal. He met one of the executives there, and he was pitching a story, which is basically a remake and adaptation of one of his dad's films. And the executive he was pitching to had never heard of Steve McQueen. <laughs> what can you do, right? What can you do? So never underestimate the level of ignorance that you can be confronted with by people on the other side. They, you know, I mean, talking to Hampton Fancher, Hampton Fancher makes me sound like a, a toad under a stone. I mean, in terms of literary knowledge, insight. I mean, every time I talk to this guy, he's quoting writers, French writers, German writers, um, obscure 19th century writers. I mean, this this guy's an art. I mean, we're talking about paintings and, and music and, and, and the depth of this guy's cultural understanding is just immense. I mean, I'm in awe of them. This is a guy who never went to college. Never went to college. And, and we, the discussions we have, and I'm like, okay, who was that writer in 19th century Viennese? You know, I've never heard of him. Oh, you haven't heard because he inspired Freud and that led to Jung and... and 
you as a, as writers have to have that background if you want to be really top of the game because you know if you, if you don't have an understanding of greek mythology and all these kind of things you know, so many the bible uh, so many of these sources go back you know to to those to those roots so you as writers have to do it. and unfortunately a lot of people you'll be a number of the people you'll be talking to on the other side you will kind of go seriously you've never heard of Proust or or, or you know or Hammond Hesse or you know so on and so forth you just have to like grin and bear it yes so following up on the knowledge point do they expect you to have say an MA in screenwriting no they couldn't care less they could not care less um I'll tell you one thing about education levels there's key film schools USC, UCLA, at times New York Tisch, um, that has a network that is just superb. So a lot of their old boys and old girls and so on and so forth, graduates are major players in the industry. And so if you impress somebody at that film school, they will pick up the phone to a major agent to and so on and so forth. So a lot of people go and do those courses just because of the, 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 the network. Having said that, the other side of the equation is Ivy League. If you want to Harvard, Stanford, Yale, Princeton, MIT, and so on and so forth, you are the major, probably Oxford and Cambridge, you are the major disadvantage when you arrive in the industry because they think you're way too clever for your own good. You will not generate material that is going to be of interest to the average, you know, uh, muggle out there. And, and, um, and so I've seen a lot of Ivy League people being superseded by USC, UCLA, whatever people, because they say, yeah, they've probably got a little bit more down-to-earth tastes and, and uh, uh, interests and so on and so forth, which is quite astonishing, really, isn't it? But I, I can see where they're coming from. You know, I can see where they're coming from. Yeah, so I'm not sure if that answers your question, but uh, yeah, kind of weird. Um, again, <laughs> the other time. Uh, any... Any other questions? Anything unclear? On the flip side of that, if you were looking at more of a um, commercially minded masters, like say in publishing, like mm. literary publishing, isn't it? What What do you think the benefit of doing something like that would be? Is that important? So yet? I just did an MA in, in as I said, in, in um, creative writing, um, uh, biography writing, narrative nonfiction, blah blah blah. Um, so it comes down to two things. It comes down to the people who are teaching you. If they have a body of work that you really respect and that is kind of synergistic where, where, where you want to go and what you want to do. And the same thing applies if you really impress them, they might well pick up the phone to, to, to help you. Um, um, I found the course that I did was um, very disappointing because um, the, the kind of way of putting it, um, uh, the people were teaching hadn't really published anything that anybody read in a decade. So they're kind of out of loop. So when I was kind of going, well, look, I've written a 70 page um, publisher's proposal and I could get some publishers. Who's a good agent? They're going to go, I'm out of the loop. <laughs> I don't know who the hot agents are. I don't know what publishers are doing, what and so on and so forth. So you really want to be uh, picking a course that is um, on top of it, that has people who are really engaged in the industry recently and are doing things and whose, whose work you respect. Otherwise, the publishing industry, I don't want to say that if you did a, um, if you did an MA from a well-known course, let's say from the University of East Anglia, the literary side of things is fairly strong. It doesn't open a couple of doors. But on the whole, at the end of the day, they just really want to see how, how good you are, how you present yourself. Um, so you need to ask yourself whether that, that is money well spent. Uh, truth be told, in terms of quality of feedback and support system, in many instances, I have seen uh, people get more support from, from, from people uh, in, in those writing groups you meet through in the libraries and stuff like that. Um, so I don't want to shoot down these things, but just having been on the other side of the equation as an agent and you know having quite a lot of interaction with the, with the publishing industry as well, it, you really pick you know pick the course, pick the people, be specific. Don't just do a course in order to do a course. At the end of the day, the the industry doesn't really care if you, if you have an MA. Now, as I said, Hampton didn't even do um, didn't even go to college. And there's some people who got multiple degrees and. They can't write that way out of paperback. So um, at, at times, 
you know, it's like it's again back to my pet hate, um, McKee. At times, you can overwhelm a writer with too many questions to ask of the next paragraph, and that acts like you know becomes like driving a car with a handbrake on. At times, you just need to let go. You know, your voice, your talent, you know, whatever. Just, just go, write it. You know, what I'm saying, don't ask too many questions. The problem with, I think, why my my writer, the Fox writer, couldn't deal with this thing was because there were so many questions he he was being asked, and he couldn't answer all of them, and he was desperately trying to answer all of them instead of just saying, you know, I'll answer one of them, but I don't care about the rest. I'm going to move on. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions before we break for lunch? Oh, yes. Me. Yes, you. <laughs> you do send, send the script. I know it's a technical question, but do, do you send the whole script or an extract? Or no, 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 you have to send the whole script. Okay. Some, I mean, every agency has its own um, requirements and they get really ticked off when you don't stick to their guidelines. <laughs> I always ignore them. And <laughs> I just got through anyway. But, I, you know, like when you contact an agency, like you go to a British agency site. And they have all these guidelines and they say, well, send it to, you know, this email address and so on. And it's the truth be told, it's the office flunky. It's the intern. Do you really want to be read that by that person? I'm going to get into it later on. You don't. OK, you're better off not being read by that person, uh, not being in the system as a pass. So what I always do is I go onto social media and I connect through LinkedIn with the agent in question and or the publisher in question. And uh, I will start off a very brief. You need to be very sparse with your wordage. You know, don't write them this great big thing. You know, two or three words. Be fun. Be interesting. Respond to something that they just <laughs> recently um, published or, or done, and so on and so forth. Be be entertaining. Be fun, and and engage with them, and just say, hey, you know, I wrote this thing. There's a one sentence thing, and. We do it well. I mean, that's how I got all these agents. Um, Eighty percent of the time, yeah, just send it to me directly. It is well worth the sweat equity invested in doing that game through to the agent or publisher directly rather than going through the intern. Okay, great. Thank you so much, guys, and uh, see you after lunch. <laughs>